everyone. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, I am Hina Popel, and I'm an Agile practitioner at Red Hat. And hopefully at the end of this uh, talk, when I tell everyone that Scrum and Kanban are stupid, I still have a job. I'm, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Uh, I've been doing this for like hmm, 10, over 10 years. I still think I'm 22, but I'm, I'm more than uh, 22 now. So yeah, they still, they still keep me employed. So first, I don't know how many people are on the line, but I would like for anyone who's interested in participating to pull up your phone or your laptop, scan the QR code or go to that link because this stuff can get boring without a little participation. <clears throat> and luckily, I see if you are joining, if you have any issues, let me know. Otherwise, I'll give you another 15, 20 seconds. I'm glad people are using the uh, reactions at the bottom because I always feel like it's just me who likes to click things. Okay, we'll give everyone maybe another five seconds to join. Um, that URL should be at the top of all the slides in case you get kicked out. Uh, this is not a test though, so if you don't want to participate, I won't tell your boss. All right. <clears throat> Anyone need one more second or two? So first, <laughs> because this is Agile, let's see if we can actually use this tool. Um, take a few seconds. If you can have a superpower, what would it be? Wow, quite super strength is not popular. No one has snow in the winter where they're shoveling all the time, you know, especially this part of the world. Okay, maybe my snow plug got someone else to uh, do that. All right, I think we're good. So here are the results. Invisibility, super speed flying, you guys are popular. Super strength. You're going to regret that answer the second you start shoveling. Um, and then, for fun, and also this is just another way to test the data entry, which languages do you speak? Uh, I'm also always curious on this. Uh, I'm originally from Afghanistan, so I grew up speaking English and Pashto. And then, uh, long story short, my brother married someone from Afghanistan who speaks a different language. And so that kind of got stuck in my head too, Farsi. So it's always fun to see. We'll do some scrolling. Oh, very nice. Very cool. <laughs> some of these languages I've never even heard of, like this. Also, after, after this session, if you ever want to teach me any of your languages, feel free. I speak pretty bad Spanish, so uh, we can also do that too. But it gets better, you know, in the right environments. <clears throat> All right, very cool. So we have quite a few languages coming in here, too. All right, that was really for my own curiosity to kind of get to know you all. And, um, you know, I have to have fun, too. I'm just, I'm not here just to talk. So let's get into the, the reason why you're all sitting in this room is the reality of Agile. So the first thing is, I actually do have an important and relevant question for you all. What is your experience with Agile? Do you think it's ineffective? Does it have potential? It's very helpful? Fill it out. Let us know. There is space in the corner. Oh. Wow. You know, uh, maybe it's a red hat thing or it's my luck. Every job I've ever had, maybe over the last 10 plus years, because I'm not 21, everyone's hated Agile. And they're like, don't, they use words that are not appropriate to be said streaming. Um, but they hate it, so it's nice to see. It's nice to see you all have a pretty positive impact, or uh, outlook. <coughs> so, here's where my pessimists that I work with, here's where they feel about Agile. So the first one is, 
all it is is your Scrum Master is asking you to update Jira. And they get really mad at you, especially towards that last bit of the sprint. Have you updated Jira yet? Close out your tickets. Are you carrying over tickets to the end of the sprint again? And once you do that, and usually Jira is full of lies anyway, then you're good. You're agile. You keep lit doing literally what you were going to do every day, which was work. And at the end of some magical time box, you put some data in something so your Scrum Master is happy. Does your Scrum Master really know the progress? No, not really. You're still doing what you're doing. Uh, and also, this is another Jira is full of lies. If it's not in Jira, it doesn't exist. Meaning you're not doing anything, right? If you didn't put it, it's not in a card, you're not working. That's the truth. No? <clears throat> and my favorites before we get out of this is Liam Neeson, Taken. He will not look for you if you update Jira. So there's a lot of Jira, by the way, that's equated to Agile every time you use it. Use the Vitrello, now it's Jira, people hate it. I don't know why people are developing software on uh, planes, the cars we drive, but they can't use Jira. And <laughs> I'm sitting there going, but I'm driving a car with your software and you're telling me that Jira is defeating you? All right. And then also your opinions. I don't think Scrum is truly agile. Batman won't let you save it, talk about it until the retro because that's the only time you can provide feedback is a retrospective. And it's always valuable and it's effective and you go there feeling so enlightened and collaborative, right? Right? I see the enthusiasm. All right, so aside from that, I wanna know what do you think of, like which words come to mind when you think of uh, successful collaboration? And there's no right answer, so. Don't be shy. Welcome. There's some spots over there. And in case you need a reminder, if you want to access and participate, that link up there will get you here. Okay. <clears throat> so we're seeing words come in. Very nice. So I'm just going to call some out. Uh, we have teamwork, keeping your word, communication, understanding, team spirit. Oh, let's jump on a quick call. That one. That one's a great one. What I'm not seeing here, Scrum, Kanban, um, Scrumban, right? That actually doesn't matter. But we often focus on things like, oh, we want to be agile, deliver fast, deliver software, be effective. Let's do Scrum. No, none of you believe that either. It's about these words that are helpful. And so we need to pay attention to these words. Here's your traditional agile transformation. Step one, become agile. Someone, usually the boss, the person paying the paycheck, someone went to a conference, they're talking about agile transformations and they say, oh, I want that too. Okay, we're gonna be agile. So we're gonna go in and we're gonna use either Scrum or Kanban. Scrum, it looks cute. It's kind of like MIDI waterfalls. We see progress every two, three weeks, maybe a month max, and everyone finishes things. We give things to our customers every two weeks, we're good. So how do we implement Scrum? We have daily stand-up, and we have meetings all day. Correct? Yeah. Oh. That, if you're doing that, then you have an A-plus in Scrum. If you have meetings all day where you can't even go to the bathroom in between, you are a professional at Scrum. Then we have Kanban, because sometimes people want to rebel against Scrum. Like, I don't want all these meetings. So how do we do Kanban? We create a card. What is a card? And what is Kanban even? <laughs> so those are your agile transformations right there. But the reality is, eventually, you're like, what is Scrum and Kanban? I don't, 
it doesn't do anything for me other than usually make me a little bit miserable and not let me have a coffee break in the, between my day. Then you understand Agile's the mindset. All of these rules are there supposedly to help you. If they help you, good, great, enjoy it. If they don't help you, you change it. And that's the most important thing is it's about working on things, collaborating, and actually getting things done. So let's talk about Agile because I can't believe I'm still saying this. Agile, it's a methodology. It's a mindset. It's a how you approach things. It's not a framework. So this is the, there's 12 principles in the manifesto. Some really smart people got together in 2001 at a ski resort philosophizing. They put stuff out with words, and because it's old, someone put together an infographic because who doesn't want to look at pictures instead of reading things? There's no reference to frameworks here. Satisfy the customer, welcome change, deliver, work together, trust and support, face-to-face -face conversation, ugh, virtual to, you know, phone to phone, video to video. All of this stuff, it's important, and there's not one way how to do it. That's the secret is, it's not about Scrum, it's not about Kanban. People used it and they thought it was effective. But the reality is, if it's a barrier, if it's meetings all day, that's not agile at all. You're just doing something to do it. This is where you need to go when you're talking about being agile with your teams. And we'll talk a little bit more about what that really means towards the end. So, when we look at the manifesto, we think, how do we do this? Often we think about communication as key, but I, for one, know that communication isn't key. It's listening because I could be talking, I could be talking right now, and you could be thinking about 17 other things. Where am I going to go after this? Where's drinks after? What am I going to eat for lunch? Did I get enough sleep? So if those words, if these words that I'm not um, saying are not resonating with you, it's not really communication. It's just a person up here talking while you've got other things going on in your mind. That's it. So communication isn't key because you have to receive that communication. You have to listen to that communication. How many people have we worked with that love to talk? There's so many people that I know that I just instantly tune out because they just wanted to hear their voice. They're not adding contributions. They, they have the loudest opinion. And honestly, once the loudest opinion starts, a lot of people are like, this again? All right, we'll wait till he stops or they stop, and then we'll go do whatever we need to do offline after the fact. This is communication where words are being said and they're being received. And that is the most important part is this person is listening. And in the dialogue, there has to be listening. Otherwise, you're just using your breath or you're typing and it's a thought in the universe, but the universe isn't going to help you merge PRs. So the rule of the land. Communication is nothing without effectively listening. Effectively listening. I, you, I can hear you. you can, I can ask you how your day is, and you could say something, and I'll pick up context clues, but I wouldn't really be paying attention. Are there any Americans in the room where we ask, hi, how are you? And we don't really mean it. So if someone actually tells you how you are, you're just kind of like, ooh. I just wanted you to say fine or good, back away. Um, <clears throat> also, in order to feel valued, you have to feel like you're being listened to. If you're not listened to, it's very, very easy to kind of shrink yourself. And it's then once you've shrunk yourself, it's hard to contribute. It's hard to feel like you are part of the team. It's hard to feel like you're effective, uh, which I kind of just said in this last bullet, just all in one. And here, our friend. I know you hear me, but are you listening? This is a good one. So let's talk about really what is listening. This is from the internet, my best friend, my tried and true. I googled less listening, and they took the Oxford Dictionary definition. I don't pay for the Oxford Dictionary, so Google does. They pull the API. But if we take a look at it, it's giving attention to a sound. Uh, taking notice of action on what someone says, response to advice or, well, let me move that mouse, or a request. And here is the most important, make an effort to hear something, be alert and ready to hear something. 
So listening, it's a verb. It's not just I'm doing something, you're actually having to actively participate and hear the words that are coming. They're supposed to resonate with you, you process them, and if you don't understand, you ask for uh, clarification. So before I go into the next slide, I do have a very philosophical question. Can you successfully co contribute to a team if you don't feel included? Oh, nope, hold on. Now you can submit. And remember, there's no right or wrong answer. You can answer whatever you want. All right, so now 90% say no. And this very much resonates. I asked some of my friends and my peers. The next slide is going to be information overload, but these slides will be available if you want to read everything that's on here. So I asked them, I said, how do you feel if you aren't listened to in the workplace? In the workplace, right, in your personal life, it's very frustrating for a slew of reasons. But the job you get paid for, so it might be a different, it might be a different thing. But there were very common patterns and trends to what they were saying. Annoyed. I, I'm Afghan, so I'm kind of a hothead. I don't show it, but I get really angry very easily, and I keep it inside because it's inappropriate. Um, trigger my imposter syndrome. Uh, feeling like my input isn't valuable. It's uh, wondering if you're second guessing, if you've been clear or unclear, um, not respected, valued. You're there, you're doing a job, you should be respected. Unless you give someone a reason not to be respected, which that's a conversation realistically between management, everyone deserves the basic decency of feeling like they're valued and respected at their job. And if not, that is something that should change immediately. Um, Fundamentally, people want to be understood. So if you're not listened to, then you can't get that fundamental out there. Um, <clears throat> so here's my peers. I hope that resonates with you. Uh, this is kind of the motivator of why it's important to listen. It's important to make people feel included because they're doing this job, right? The process is there so everyone can effectively collaborate together. But if it's just a process where you're following through the motions and no one's listening to you, no one's hearing you, how are you really gonna develop and collaborate and communicate effective solutions? At the end of the day, then you're just getting a paycheck and you're, you're existing until you get your next job. So how do you feel when you're not listened to? This is uh, unlocked. I wanna see if you have similar answers to my colleagues because you might feel great and that's okay. And as you all are answering, because this is a vulnerability session too, I will tell you I have crazy imposter syndrome, especially when I'm not being listened to. I feel like, what is my contribution to this team if no one values my opinion? And then I also feel like, can I really make change? Why participate here? I could participate somewhere else. But there's also dark times where there's burnout or I don't feel like I've been listened to for a long period of time where then it ripples into everything, and I think I can't even get another job if I wanted to because my contributions clearly aren't that great. That's not true. Uh, I still have a job after this too. Um, but it really messes with your psyche and being able to contribute. And if we looked at that picture from the beginning, the Agile principles, it's all about collaboration and communication and getting things done. So. Y'all are feeling it too. Um, I'm glad I said that vulnerable thing because if everyone was like, I feel great, Hina's just crazy, I'd been like, oh man. All right, so let's talk about how to apply listening. I'm talking about it from an agile coach perspective, right? Your scrub masters, your project managers, your team leads, etc. But the reality is everyone who's involved in this process of doing work, they can absolutely 
implement these because at the end of the day, unless you're working individually as a silo from start to finish, you're collaborating somehow. And so you need to get things done. So the fundamental of listening is there has to be follow through. You have to prove that you're listening. It's not just, I hear you. It's, all right, I am hearing you. And what are we going to do about it? Are we going to make changes? Are we going to uh, have metrics to measure us? Are we going to break the system? And there's no right or wrong answer because everything is the empirical method. You're learning as you go. And it might not work, right? If, you're, if I'm saying, I don't like this, I don't like Scrum. All right, so we philosophize about changing it. Let's say that it didn't work. That's completely fine. But the most crucial part was we followed through on that initial thought. And you can revert your changes just like you can revert a lot of things. It's completely fine. But what's not fine is if you say something like, I don't like this, this isn't working, and you do nothing about it. What's the purpose of that? Um, you have to enable trust when something is brought up. I have worked on plenty of teams where people will bring up their problems and no one will actually do anything about it. So at some point, they're kind of like, well, what's the point? What's the point of talking about this? No one listens to me. Nothing will change. I can't do anything about it. And then I'm stuck in this cycle. And it's not just that one person that's feeling it. It's plenty of people that are kind of like, I'm stuck. What's the purpose? All right, we do this scrum thing. We have meetings all day. I can't go to the bathroom Mondays through Thursdays. And this is my life. It's, it's miserable. So making sure that people have the voice to say it's miserable and the space is extremely important. If you don't have that, then you're stuck. You're stuck with a team that can never be listened to. You've proven that. And you've got to make some cultural changes there because at the end of the day, you can't be agile without a trustful environment. You can't do things. It's kind of, it's a scary thing where you're just developing code or you're doing whatever your day job is, but you have no say, so you're just a robot. But I don't believe that any of you in this room are robots, to be honest with you. Um, and then you have to also encourage individuals because yes, you can have a trustful environment, but just because the environment is safe doesn't mean people are gonna bring up their thoughts. Doesn't mean that they wanna vocalize them or type them. You have to find that way that will be able to draw that out of people. Because in the beginning, it's not free. People speaking up, it doesn't come for free. You have to build that where people feel like they can trust the system, where if they bring up an issue, they're not reprimanded. And in all honesty, unless you have a really healthy environment, most people are afraid to bring things up. And how do you blame them, right? You have to make sure you establish that trust. So one of my favorites is in meetings when you hear your name, and you're like, not paying attention, right? Then you hear, Hina, can you get that done? Or Hina, what's the status of this? And you're like, oh, let me get back to you. Pinging your colleagues, what did they say? What am I supposed to respond to? I wasn't paying attention. But why not just say it in the meeting? And I actually have meetings where I start out going, hey, if you zoned out, that's completely fine. I do it too. Just ask for the question to be repeated. And I worked in a team. It was also the beginning of the pandemic, so all, all kinds of things were weird. But the environment was very closed. It was very scared. It was a very scary environment where people didn't feel comfortable to say anything. The process was rigid. It was like, it was like an army process. So it was very difficult. So to admit that you weren't paying attention, to admit that you weren't following, people felt really, really uncomfortable, and they didn't. They just sat there, and after the fact, they, they were really stressed. They were burned out. It, it was making them mentally, like, very miserable. So I was like, all right, I get why they can't bring this up. So I'll bring it up for them. And eventually, I would start saying things, and as, an, as a facilitator in this uh, sense. I'm going to start that. And now it's completely fine in this venue and this team to say, sorry, I wasn't listening. I'll get into if they're sorry, I wasn't listening. You probably should wonder and ask your team for feedback about the purpose of meetings or et cetera. But making it okay to say, I zoned out, I wasn't listening, I was at the door, 
I'm really tired, it's hard for me to follow, or this meeting is nonsense, why am I here? It's important. Others are repeating information in your own words to ensure you're on the same page. So making listening safe is also making sure that you're on the same page. And I worked with someone years ago who, would, who was an architect, and he would do the most beautiful thing. Everyone would speak, and what he would do is he would process it, and then he would spit it back, just to make sure that they were on the same page. It was the most beautiful thing. Why? Because everyone went off and they effectively delivered on the solution that they defined. Because what that regurgitation was, was saying, hey, um, well, what example can I use? Building a house. Someone says, I want like a smart home. What he would do is he would take all that feedback from everyone brainstorming and he would say, okay, so we want to, let me just make it clear, we want a kitchen with reverse osmosis water so people can add chemicals in there and brew really great coffee. I really like coffee, so for me the water is very important. But what happened there is when he would, he would say his understanding of what people were saying is immediately they just closed the gap between what we agreed to and what we're going to do. Because half of the time, if not more, what we agreed to and what we were going to do has a delta. Because not everyone is on the same page. So they go off and do it, and then they start getting feedback going, hold on, we didn't agree to this. And they're like, wait, we agreed to it two weeks ago. No, we agreed to something different. It's just we weren't on the same page, so we never really agreed to, this, to the right thing. Um, and then, Providing multiple ways to communicate so everyone can insert their voice. One thing that's really important about listening is communicating is different for everyone. I work in a place that's globally distributed. English is not everyone's first language, but they're expected to communicate at the end of the day in English. For someone like me, even for someone like me, sometimes English is tough, to be honest with you. But the spoken way, it's co more comfortable. Someone else, it might be easier to type for them, right? So they can actually think about, they have the time to say, hey, here's what I want to say. So sometimes you have to provide different ways, meetings, chat channels, emails, design documents, different ways where people can provide their input and you can listen. Um, we were working with a team that was based out of Beijing. Their English was beautiful, but they weren't confident in how they spoke it. They wanted time to process. So in the beginning, the team in, the, in North America didn't understand why there was such a delay and there was such a gap between communication. And so as I started working with this team, I was kind of like, well, why is there a gap? And they would say, well, there's delays and you know, we go out of these meetings and sometimes we're on the same page, but something else happens, something different. I was like, all right, well, let me take a look at this. And so as I kind of figured out, our folks in Beijing, English was brilliant, beautiful, but it was more comfortable for them to read things because it gave them more time to process. And especially working with different audiences, including myself, if someone uses a big word in a conversation and I don't know it, I stopped. So like, the conversation will be going, going, going. You use something that was very, very great English. And instead of me listening to whatever's going on, I'm thinking, what is this word? I've never heard it, what does it mean? Okay, so I'm repeating the sentence before to try to figure that out. So while the conversation is now like here, I'm still stuck trying to figure out, should I Google this really quickly? Um, and what are they talking about now? I'm stuck. And how can I use this in my daily language the next time I have a meeting? Which is great for learning things, it's not great for communicating, it's not great for listening, and not great for getting things done. So assessing where your team's comfort is in communication and there might be various ways, is important because when you go into your processes, you tailor it to say, all right, where do we have meetings? Where do we speak in chat? Where do we speak in emails? Where do we speak in design documents? That is the most important thing, is asking your team what they're comfortable with. And it's not gonna be one or the other, it's going to be a combination. Different pockets of people communicate differently. Let's check on time. I've got plenty of time, yeah? So, listening in meetings. Oh, 
I don't know about you all, but meetings have skyrocketed since the start of the pandemic, right? Or, or have you always had a bunch of them? All right. Well, so many of these meetings, I think, are nonsense. And I'm, I'm that person that's facilitating meetings left and right. Hina, can you do this? Set the agenda, blah, blah, blah. Uh, we need to make decisions. And I'm like, okay, okay, yeah, fine, right? So I can understand the initial request and the purpose. But the reality is, did we need these meetings? And did we need them for the rest of our lives? We needed to sync with PM. So we probably needed a good six meetings, right? Every week for an hour, meet with our PMs for X decisions. But what happened is, what happens, not even what happened, this is a use case that can be echoed into so many things. Those six meetings weren't just six meetings, they were recurring meetings for the rest of our lives. And it's kind of like we sit there going, mm, what's on the agenda? Should we cancel? No, no, it's important. We need a space to sync with PM. So they meet and it's nonsense. Everyone goes in and they're like, what should we talk about? Nothing, nothing. We talked about this on Monday. You want me to talk about it again? This is Wednesday. Like, I don't know why we're still here. So listening to the purpose of the meetings, is there a reason? If the answer is yes, meet. If the answer is no, don't. And also be vocal about it to say, hey, this meeting no longer serves its purpose. Cancel it. It's completely fine. And if there's any people in the team lead role, in the agile coach, in the project manager, in the manager role, it is your responsibility because it's more uncomfortable for the in individual contributor to really push their thoughts. They'll, they'll have comments, right? This isn't that valuable. But they won't go as forward with it. So you need to, you actually need to listen to them and say, okay, I hear your comments. Let me, let me listen to what you're saying. Oh, we're really wasting an hour of our time every, every week. Or let's say you cancel it. You end it 20 minutes, uh, you end your meeting 20 minutes early every week. Then that's a cue. You're wasting your time. Listen to what's going on and shorten it or skip it biweekly. Something, change it. Um, finding value out of the meetings. This is so important because really, if you're going to spend your time in meetings, make sure that it's important. And you can ask surveys. I just had a meeting. We had, here's a real use case. We would have these release planning things called ready, ready ceremonies or requirements freeze. And at the time, all we were doing was checking, did you fill out the paperwork correctly? Every single release, we would have this meeting saying, okay, it's requirements freeze time. Did you check all the boxes in JIRA? Why does someone need a meeting to check that all the JIRA boxes were checked for a good 50 people in one, in one venue? You don't. So after lots of frustration, we changed it up. And what did we do? We actually said, all right, so first, tell me what you think is valuable was the most important thing to the individual contributors that were playing part in this that would find value. And then after we held the meeting and we sent out a survey to make sure whatever we were doing was valuable. But the caveat, the survey, if I create the survey, will you fill it out? If the answer is no, don't send it out. Don't waste your time creating it. And the second part is when you answer, and here's where surveys go to die, right? You fill out a survey, you provide your input, no one ever does anything about it. <laughs> it's like, why did I spend these minutes typing my thoughts just so they could go into your, your database? Or do you put them under your pillow so you could go, ah, oh, yes, everyone's filled out the survey and now we're good. No, take those results and review them. It doesn't have to be with all 50 people, but you actually have to say, hey, we've reviewed them and this is what we're gonna do next time based on your feedback. It's not hard. It makes life better in the future. And you actually are adding value to people's lives. As an Agile coach, people hate things like Agile, Scrum, Kanban, all of it. But throughout the years, my approach has changed to say, forget about these things. I'll listen to you. And people start going, thank you. Agile is good because they're being listened to and we're changing things as we go. Observe to see how people are communicating. 
my example with our Beijing team and the North Americans was me understanding, oh, it's very hard. And I also, like I said, you, what's a big word in English? Anyone have one? A big word, a complicated word. Superfluous audacity. Whichever one, we used them, it got stuck here. So I was also in that situation. And then I said, okay, so I can see where people are getting stuck, not paying attention, especially for my beautifully well-read people with the best intentions. I know you read a lot of books sometimes, but this isn't a book. We're talking to each other on a basic level, come on, so we can get work done. I don't, I don't need to hear your PhD thesis support, right? I just need to know, are we doing it this way or this way? Um, so observing is really important and making sure everyone who wants to speak has a chance. You can do this by using the hand raise function in a video call, have a facilitator, mo facilitator monitor the chat, but know that not everyone wants to bring their voice up, right? It's hard to, un first of all, even if you're speaking the native language, it's hard to know when do I unmute and put my thoughts in. But your thoughts are important. It's important to say, hey, put stuff in the chat or use the hand raise button because you might have the best idea and it'll never come out into light because you didn't know where to put it. And it was uncomfortable to either speak over someone or know when it was your turn to say something and stuff is time boxed, right? 55 minutes, 60 minutes in or 30 minutes in, even if you had the best idea and you were gonna cure cancer, it's not happening because you didn't have time to bring up your thoughts. So you need to be able to have a way where everyone who wants to say something can say something. And that is stuff like raise your hand in a meeting or use those hand raise functions right in the chat and it's important to have someone actually monitor and follow through. If you didn't answer the question, if you didn't address it, before you leave a meeting, the question should be, hey, do you feel like this is important enough? Or maybe they're not comfortable saying that yet, so create that safe space. But hey, how are we gonna address this point that we didn't get to? Do we kick off an email? Do we spend more time? It's annoying, right? No one wants to spend more time in meetings or type up an email. But if it's very valuable, they will say, okay, let's discuss this in X, Y, or Z venue. <clears throat> Then there's my favorite, process definition. This one is in the beginning, right? Where you're usually handed this gift of Scrum, this gift of Kanban. But we're asking people to innovate. We're asking people to create software or create something. Forget about software. I work in tech, but you're creating, you're delivering. And you're trusting them to do something that's valuable to some end user. But you're not trusting them to say how they wanna work. You're only giving them options of Scrum or Kanban which is ridiculous. Where did Scrum come from? Where did Kanban come from? They came from the way people wanted to work and the way that they found was effective to them. So if your team finds something that's effective for them, why not listen? You can be the next Scrum, you can be the next Kanban, or you can just have a healthy environment where you work and you deliver on a way that was your terms, that you agreed to. And as long as you're seeing what you wanted, the results of what you wanted, you don't have to adhere to any specific framework that the industry says is popular right now. So there's a bunch of questions here, but essentially the summary of it is you can use things like a team working agreement, sit everyone down at whatever level and say, all right, so <clears throat> how do we want to con communicate? How do we want to contribute? Do we, where do we want to track work? Um, do we have Slack? Do we have Google chat? Do we want to have email focused? Along the way, listen and make sure that it's working for you all, but let the team decide. They're the ones doing the work. They're the ones communicating. It's not a scrum master's job to say, well, the book says this, and so we really have to do it this way because this is the most valuable. No, that's not it at all. If your uh, teams are complaining and saying, hey, this is nonsense, I want, let's see, sprint planning, grooming, stand-ups. I want five, hours of my week back, and I can give everything that you wanted in those five hours asynchronously to you. I can give it to you in 30 minutes. Go for it, listen to them, let them do it. If it doesn't work, then ask them, hey, 
this is not meeting the bill. How can we get this in a different way? Should we revert back to the old ways or should we try another way? It's not the end of the world if it doesn't work, but it isn't a pleasant environment if you're spending these six hours where you think you could do this all offline for free. Oh. Where did we go? There we go. Um, <clears throat> and also, listen to who needs to be involved. Not everyone has to be in all these meetings. To be honest with you, I sometimes go, why are we all here? It's just two of you talking. Can you all talk and get back to us in chat or something along the lines of that? Um, know who needs to be involved. We want to be open and we want to be inclusive, but there's ways to do that. And the best way is to ask the team, team, do you all care about this? The answer is no. Who, who does and who needs to be involved? They're very simple questions, but they're questions that everyone always ignores because they're so stuck in process and scrum and what's the right thing to do in the workplace. But there's no right thing. You want to be effective. So in these working agreements, just list that out and ask everyone for their opinions. Define it. If something is making you uncomfortable, then raise that and say, all right, so here's my concerns. If the team says, hey, no, 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 we got this, all you have to ask is, all right, so how will we follow through? And let them follow through. The whole idea of agile is what fail fast and fail early. Fail is a, you know, a controversial word, but you're supposed to learn from it and you're supposed to refine the process. You're not going to know right away what's right because no one that I know is psychic. If you are, great, let me know. I also want to know how to retire early, so if you could tell me what numbers to put in the lottery. Ah, and listening for our change resistors. So change should happen for a reason. This is when you want to do something and you think it's important. Let's say you wanted to do Scrum because you needed a framework or you wanted to do something specific. People are, including myself, are resistant to change. But if you explain to them what needs to change, why it needs to change, and how it's impacting the team, then you're putting people on the spot to say, I am here with this problem statement, and I will listen to you. Give me potential solutions. You don't have to say you have to do daily stand-up because we're not thinking. You can say, hey, we, we don't know where we're going with things. We don't know how. How can we exchange uh, or have that transparency, that visibility? You don't want to do daily stand-ups, no problem. Tell me how you'd like to sync. And then listen to them within satisfaction, right? They can't be like, hey, I'm going to send this owl and it's going to you know, take little notes to my friend's house and then they'll broadcast it on the daily news. That's you know, not maybe realistic. But if they say, we don't need daily stand-ups, we, co we communicate daily on Slack or we communicate via email or here's where we can see all this information, the transparency, if that is something that's accessible, listen to it, take it. Or if we don't want to have sprint planning sessions, but you still want to run some kind of scrum, great, no worries, do it all offline. That's not a problem. You already know what you're working on. I don't really have a stake in it. Just show us the stack before we say, yes, this is what we're gonna get in our sprint in case we need to reprioritize things. It's not a problem. Let the teams do what they want to do and make sure that you know everyone is on the same page. Otherwise, there's nothing that should stop you from that. So, not only is there resistance to change, but there's indifference. And indifference is a very easy one. I don't care. The approach is very similar. But if someone is indifferent, you can just say, hey, here's the problem, once again. Um, tell people why it's being suggested. Allow teams to suggest the format. This is where indifference comes, where it's quiet, like I don't care, I don't, I don't care one way or the other, just tell me what to do. And so then you propose. You can say, hey, all right, if you don't care, let's go with um, Kanban tickets, put everything in JIRA, make sure everything is being worked on. And then if they say no, that's completely fine. The only thing you need to do is say, if you're gonna say no, you have to give me a solution. I proposed Kanban because that's what was comfortable for me. But if you have another way, provide it. Either they'll have another way and the team will agree, but likely 75% of the time, they'll say, all right, I don't, have a, I don't have anything better, let's try it. 
And that's your problem solved. You take all of this animosity and this anti-process away because you gave people the right to voice how they wanted to do things. And if they really didn't care, you can say, hey, you told me you didn't care. This is how we we're practicing it. If, if you find somewhere better, we'll do it along the way. But realistically, they don't care enough. So you're automatically minimizing the complaints that come their way. And you're also giving people a lot of value because you're telling them, we can do this differently. You just have to tell me. <clears throat> and listening for feedback. Don't wait for retrospectives. Does anyone love retrospectives in this room? Oh, okay, couple, couple. Retrospectives are not the only time you can say something is working or something's not working, something is gonna change. Because one, you might forget along the way, and two, why not have feedback real time? Why not make changes real time? So you can always ask, do you find value in this? Do you find value in this meeting? Do you find value in the way we're doing things? Do you find value in uh, tracking things in JIRA versus Google Docs? Have a conversation. If that conversation spans to be longer, then you can say, all right, so this is really important. We'll take a, a retrospective to discuss this topic. Or maybe we'll spend 30 minutes next week and here someone will put out a proper format to say, hey, let's refine this process. But asking that question along the way is fine. You see people in, in daily stand-ups and they're zoned out and they don't care. What's wrong with asking, hey, is anyone getting value out of this stand-up? Or are you just having this because your scrum master says, everyone, let's have a stand-up Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And it's going to be 15 minutes, and we're going to go over because two people wanted to tell you about their entire life. And so <laughs> your daily stand-ups are 30 minutes long, and you never cared. And by the way, you said this to me yesterday. <laughs> So you're still working on this and it still took you 10 minutes to update us? No. So ask, is this valuable? If not, change it. Maybe you don't need a daily stand-up. No one is gonna, if something, if a daily stand-up is that valuable, then something is wrong in your system, right? What's going on? Are you not talking to each other? Are you not, do you not have Slack, your PRs, emails, all of the above? It shouldn't be miserable. You also should always ask if there's something we can do to make life easier. When you see bottlenecks, when you see people frustrated, when you see people stressed, something is wrong. Listen to them and ask them, what's going on? Is it our process? Are we making barriers? Is our QE backlog too long because we're over committing to development work? Um, how can we do this a little different? So ask. Just ask the people and they will tell you. You can ask them one-on-one, -on -one, you can ask them in a retrospective, you can send them an email, you can send them surveys. There's 100,000 ways to do this. Maybe not 100,000, but in an infinite way. And then, is it still relevant to us? This is for my friends, those extra meetings, those extra steps in the process that at the time are great. Sometimes they're no longer relevant, but you're still doing it. Think about your day job and think about, at a point, this was valuable, but it's not really valuable to us anymore. We're just doing it. Cut it out. If you're just doing it because at a point it was helping you and it's no longer serving its purpose, ask the team and listen to them and get rid of it. Nothing will be harmed. And if something starts being harmed, bring it back in. <clears throat> and I think this is last but not least, tools to sh help show you are listening. So this is more for the facilitator, those managers, those project managers. They can use things like value stream maps where you're taking a look at the process and you're asking, okay, so what are the steps in the process? Not the onboarding documentation that was updated 10 years ago and tells everyone, hey, this is how we work. This is the reality where you go and you say, okay, so how do we get ideas and how do we take these ideas out to delivery? What are the steps of the process where you're actually asking people what they're doing and making a map of reality so you can measure it and find those bottlenecks? Surveys, don't make them long. No one wants to fill out a survey that's more than a couple of questions. Um, and also, if you're gonna make a survey, follow through. They're not there 
to ha live in your Google Drive or they're not there to just exist. Create them, but create them with purpose and follow through and show people that you're following through because that's showing them you're listening and make changes if needed. Whiteboard sessions, allow people to brainstorm. Stop having nonsense meetings. The same meeting every week isn't necessarily valuable, but maybe cancel some of those and have whiteboard sessions and allow people to think and collaborate together. One-on-one um, -on -one interviews, meetings. This is not a weekly 101, by the way. Uh, even my manager. Manager, I don't know if you're in this conference. Weekly one-on-ones don't always do anything, but in increments, in intervals, it is okay to say, hey, Hina, or hey, Jeff, let's sync up and let's philosophize. How are things going? Not every week, maybe every quarter, every month, between you and Jeff, check in and say, hey, how are things going? Do you want to talk about any ways of improving? If the answer is no, things are fine, that's the answer. No, things are fine. But if the answer is yes, let's talk, that's a cue to say, all right, there is something that can be done where we can change things. And so that's where you can listen. <clears throat> Observing, we kind of went over, and then leveraging met metrics for conversations and not test scores. So one of the important parts is metrics that we define. In your team working agreements, or along the way when you're defining the process, ask the team what they want to do to measure themselves. If they're using things like story points, great. I don't see them working very often, but good on you. And that's how they want to measure. They want to measure velocity. They want to use throughput. They want to use sprints, whatever. They want to measure how great their CI is. Those metrics, let the team define them and let them say, here's how we want to hold ourselves accountable and measure our progress and make sure we're doing well. And then when you, when you collect those metrics, they are not saying we're bad or good. They're saying, here's the data, let's talk about it. Never good, never bad. Because at the end of the day, you're working. There's so many teams that have beautiful velocity that don't produce anything, or there's teams that have no velocity, but they're churning out so many things. It varies. But the reality is, if you're going to use those metrics that the team has said, yes, I want to measure myself, and this is how I think I'll be doing well, take a look and say, okay, so... How do you all feel versus what my favorite, my scrum masters, maybe I was one of these back in the day when I used to do scrum master work. Oh, our velocity is not so great. It's not stable. What are we doing wrong? Nothing. <laughs> We're not doing anything wrong. Maybe it's just the way we created big cards or little cards or something along the lines. Let the team say, hey, here's our velocity. What do you think? Should we change anything? Because we're not seeing the progress we want. And let them tell you yes or no. And if they're telling you, no, we don't need to change anything, that's when you ask and you challenge and you say, okay, so here was the intention of this metric. Are we getting the value out of it? And listen to them. That's it. All right. And really here is the key takeaways. So I, sh I gave you my whole spiel about listening. But when I was putting this together, I thought, the only thing that they really know, need to know is all you have to do in the world of agility and development together, whatever, product development, software, anything is listen to the people that you're collaborating with and have them tell you how they want to work. That's it. So when you're talking about agile, it is never and will never be a framework. It's not going to be Scrum. It's not going to be Kanban. Those are just ways that work in the agile field but you can be agile and never look at these frameworks. Maybe you create the next Scrum, maybe you create the next Kanban. Let your team decide how they wanna work and have them hold themselves accountable because it was their decision. And honestly, just listen to your team. They're the ones that you have to trust at the end of the day. Make them feel valued, make them feel included. We're at time? I talked a lot. If you have questions, let me know. Uh, I don't know if I'll still this whole Elon Musk. Find me on LinkedIn.
you can ask me how it I learned a lot in this session, like a lot of my thoughts felt resonated, a lot of my unsaid thoughts, yeah, that was really amazing. So it's a five minute break and then let's come back because the next session is going to be really interesting as well. Yep. I think it would be nice to lower the temperature in the room. Oh, okay, yep, I'll make sure.